But even if these risks do turn out to be significant, they seem to me to be much lower than the immense gains that proof-of-stake systems get from their far greater efficiency. Ethereum In-Depth. I'm Yoshua Zlatogorsky, and welcome to Ethereum Audible, where I'll be reading the papers, research, and articles of the Ethereum ecosystem. This is our first episode, and so I thought I'd start off with the man himself, Vitalik Buterin, on why proof of stake. There's lots of discussion and discourse out there in the ecosystem about why is Ethereum migrating over to proof of stake, and so Vitalik's brief post on November 6th of 2020 on why proof of stake is a great place to start. But first, I want to thank the sponsors of the show who made this episode possible. This episode is brought to you by Alp Audio. Want to learn on the go but need more depth than a podcast? Alp is the app for you. It's an audio education app that brings great in-depth courses that are as fun as podcasts but as educational as a degree. Each lesson comes with summaries, additional resources, flashcards, and more. You can even find Ethereum Audible on Alp with all of those additional resources. If you want to check it out, head over to get.alpaudio.com, and that's A-L-P-E, Alp, A-L-P-E. Here we go. There are three key reasons why Proof-of-Stake is a superior blockchain security mechanism compared to Proof-of-Work. Proof-of-Stake offers more security for the same cost. The easiest way to see this is to put proof-of-stake and proof-of-work side-by-side and look at how much it costs to attack a network per $1 per day in block rewards. GPU-based proof-of-work You can rent GPUs cheaply, so the cost of attacking the network is simply the cost of renting enough GPU power to outrun the existing miners. For every $1 block of rewards, the existing miner should be spending close to $1 in costs. If they're spending more, miners will drop out due to being unprofitable. If they're spending less, new miners can join in and take high profits. Hence, attacking the network just requires temporarily spending more than $1 per day, and only for a few hours. The total cost of attack is around $0.26 assuming 6 hours of attack, potentially reduced to zero as the attacker receives block rewards. ASIC-based proof-of-work ASICs are a capital cost. You buy an ASIC once, and you can expect it to be useful for about two years before it wears out and or is obsolete by newer and better hardware. If a chain gets 51% attack, the community will likely respond by changing the proof-of-work algorithm and your ASIC will lose its value. On average, mining is one-third ongoing costs and two-thirds capital costs, with a footnote to some additional resources. Hence, per $1 a day in reward, miners will be spending $0.33 per day on electricity and maintenance, and $0.67 per day on their ASIC. Assuming an ASIC lasts two years, that's $486 dollars and 67 cents that a miner would need to spend on the quantity of ASIC hardware. The total cost of attack is therefore $486.67 in ASICs plus 8 cents in electricity and maintenance, which comes out to a total of $486.75. That said, it's worth noting that ASICs provide this heightened level of security against attacks at a high cost of centralization as the barriers to entry to joining become very high. Proof of Stake Proof of Stake is almost entirely capital costs, the coins that are being deposited. The only operating costs are the cost of running a node. Now, how much capital are people willing to lock up to get $1 per day of rewards? Unlike ASICs, deposited coins do not depreciate, and when you're done staking, you get your coins back after a short delay. Hence, participants should be willing to pay much higher capital costs for the same quantity of rewards. Let's assume that a 15% rate of return is enough to motivate people to stake, and that is the expected ETH2 rate of return. 
then $1 per day of rewards will attract 6.667 years worth of returns in deposits, or $2,433. Hardware and electricity costs of a note are small. A $1,000 computer can stake for hundreds of thousands of dollars in deposits, and around $100 per month in electricity and internet is sufficient for such an amount. But conservatively, we can say that these ongoing costs are 10% of the total cost of staking, so we only have 90 cents per day of rewards that end up corresponding to capital costs, so we do need to cut the above figure by 10%. The total cost of attack, therefore, is 90 cents per day times 6.667 years, which equals $2,189. In the long run, this cost is expected to go even higher, as staking becomes more efficient and people become comfortable with lower rates of return. I personally expect this number to eventually rise to something like $10,000. Note that the only cost being incurred to get this high level of security is just the inconvenience of not being able to move your coins around at will while you are staking. It may even be the case that the public knowledge that all these coins are locked up causes the value of the coin to rise, so the total amount of money floating around in the community, ready to make productive investments, etc., remains the same. Whereas in proof of work, the cost of maintaining consensus is real electricity burned in insanely large quantities. Higher security or lower costs. Note that there are two ways to use this 5 to 20x gain in security per cost. One is to keep block rewards the same, but benefit from increased security. The other is to massively reduce block rewards, and hence the waste of the consensus mechanism and keep the security level the same. Either way is okay. I personally prefer the latter, because as we will see below, in proof of stake even a successful attack is much less harmful and much easier to recover from than an attack on proof of work. This brings us to reason number two for proof of stake. Attacks are much easier to recover from in proof of stake. In a proof of work system, if your chain gets 51% attacked, what do you even do? So far, the only response in practice has been waited out until the attacker gets bored, but this misses the possibility of a much more dangerous kind of attack called a spawn camping attack, where the attacker attacks the chain over and over again with the explicit goal of rendering it useless. In a GPU-based system, there is no defense, and a persistent attacker may quite easily render a chain permanently useless, or more realistically, switches to proof of stake or proof of authority. In fact, after the first few days, the attacker's costs may become very low, as honest miners will drop out since they have no way to get rewards while the attack is going on. In an ASIC-based system, the community can respond to the first attack, but continuing the attack from there once again becomes trivial. The community would meet the first attack by hard forking to change the proof-of-work algorithm, thereby bricking all ASICs, the attackers and honest miners. But if the attacker is willing to suffer that initial expense, after that point the situation reverts to the GPU case, as there is not enough time to build and distribute ASICs for the new algorithm. And so from there the attacker can cheaply continue the spawn camp inevitably. In the proof of stake case, however, things are much brighter. For certain kinds of 51% attacks, particularly reverting finalized blocks, there is a built-in slashing mechanism in the proof of stake consensus by which a large portion of the attacker's stake, and no one else's stake, can get automatically destroyed. For other, harder to detect attacks, notably a 51% coalition censoring anyone else, the community can coordinate on a minority user activated soft fork, in which the attacker's funds are once again largely destroyed. In Ethereum, this is done via the inactivity leak mechanism. No explicit hard fork to delete coins is required, with the exception of the requirement to coordinate on the user-activated soft fork to select a minority block. Everything else is automated and simply following the execution of the protocol rules. Hence, attacking the chain the first time will cost the attacker many millions of dollars, and the community will be back on their feet within days. Attacking the chain the second time will still cost the attacker many millions of dollars, as they would need to buy new coins to replace their old coins that were burned, and the third time will cost 
even more millions of dollars. The game is very asymmetric, and not in the attacker's favor. Reason number three. Proof of stake is more decentralized than ASICs. GPU-based proof of work is reasonably decentralized. It's not too hard to get a GPU, but GPU-based mining largely fails on the security against attacks criterion that we mentioned above. ASIC-based mining, on the other hand, requires millions of dollars of capital to get into, and if you buy an ASIC from someone else, most of the time the manufacturing company gets the far better end of the deal. This is also the correct answer to the common proof of stake means the rich get richer argument. ASIC mining also means the rich get richer, and that game is even more tilted in favor of the rich. At least in proof of stake, the minimum needed to stake is quite low and within reach of many regular people. Additionally, proof of stake is more censorship resistant. GPU mining and ASIC mining are both very easy to detect. They require huge amounts of electricity consumption, expensive hardware purchases, and large warehouses. Proof of stake staking, on the other hand, can be done on an unassuming laptop and even over a VPN. Possible advantages of proof of work. There are two primary genuine advantages of proof of work that I see, though I see these advantages as being fairly limited. Proof of stake is more like a closed system, leading to higher wealth concentration over the long term. In proof of stake, if you have some coin, you can stake that coin and get more of that coin. In proof of work, you can always earn more coins, but you need some outside resource to do so. Hence, one could argue that over the long term, proof of stake coin distributions risk becoming more and more concentrated. The main response to this that I see is, to, is simply that in proof of stake, the rewards in general, and hence validator revenues, will be quite low. In ETH2, we are expecting annual validator rewards to equal half a percent to 2% of the total ETH supply. And the more validators are staking, the lower interest rates get. Hence, it would likely take over a century for the level of concentration to double. And on such timescales, other pressures, people wanting to spend their money, distributing their money to a charity or their children, are likely to dominate. Proof of stake requires weak subjectivity. Proof of work does not. See here for the original intro to the concept of weak subjectivity. Essentially, the first time a node comes online, and any subsequent time a node comes online after being offline for a very long duration, i.e. multiple months, that node must find some third-party source to determine the correct head of the chain. This could be their friend, it could be exchanges and block explorer sites, the client developer themselves, or many other actors. Proof of work does not have this requirement. However, arguably this is a very weak requirement. In fact, users need to trust client developers and or the community to about this extent already. At the very least, users need to trust someone, usually client developers, to tell them what the protocol is and what any updates to the protocol have been. This is unavoidable in any software application. Hence, the marginal additional trust requirement that proof of stake imposes is still quite low. But even if these risks do turn out to be significant, they seem to me to be much lower than the immense gains that proof of stake systems get from their far greater efficiency and their better ability to handle and recover from attacks. So that is Vitalik Buterin's Why Proof of Stake from November of 2020. And just to wrap it up, there are three main reasons that proof of stake is the way that Ethereum is choosing to go. It is cost of attack, as in the cost to attack the network is higher than proof of work. The second is ease of recovery from that attack. It's easier to bring the community together to do a soft fork once the system gets attacked with proof of stake. And the third is network decentralization, where anyone can stake in a proof of stake system, but not everyone can mine in a proof of work system that's based on ASICs. Now, from a very high level, because the proof of stake versus proof of work argument has been going on for years, these are my thoughts on number one, cost of attack. On a dollar for dollar basis, yes, proof of stake in Ethereum does have a higher cost basis for attack because of the slashing mechanism, because you can't just camp out and that is a very mighty aspect of proof of stake. And the added benefit of that is that 
the mining rewards can then drop because you don't need such a high expense in external dollar denominated costs to secure the system. And essentially that's what leads to the ultrasound money meme that's been going around because you can drop network rewards for the same security. And that's very powerful. On the flip side, this is something I think the Ethereum ecosystem that I read and follow is discounting is just the plain difficulty of buying ASICs, getting the hash rate to attack a network. Doing things in the physical world is hard. You have to get the electricity, you have to buy the supply chain. It is hard. Physical proof of work is a very, very powerful security mechanism. On the second reason, ease of recovery from attack, here I think it's very convincing. Proof of stake is a consensus built around community. Community is built into Ethereum much more than it is to Bitcoin. And so once a system is attacked and eventually any system where the financial economic incentive is there to attack will be attacked. There's just too many options out there to stop them all. The ease of recovery is critical for the sustainability of a system. And here I really think proof of stake is very powerful. Last, I'm kind of on the fence of in terms of network decentralization. There is really, really compelling research out there that, especially with MEV, which is a topic we'll get into in future reads, to put together with high stakers can lead to centralization of power and rewards within a certain set of miners and validators, basically. In proof of work, that is also the case. There are economies of scale. There are miners who will integrate across the value chain, get the cheapest electricity, integrate backwards into the manufacturing, and they will also have economies of scale for ASICs. And so when it comes to decentralization, the jury's out. I think there's a lot to be said for both sides, but the fact that anyone can stake on any protocol is very powerful and there can just be a lot more validators and that can definitely contribute to the decentralization of the network thanks again for giving this a listen for the full show notes summaries links to other articles that are mentioned be sure to head over to alpaudio.com that's a-l-p-e audio.com i'm yoshua zlatogorski and this was ethereum audible 